Biology. This is chapter 13, section 2, and the main idea is researchers use genetic engineering to manipulate DNA. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So technology that involves manipulating the DNA of one organism in order to insert the DNA of another organism. The inserted DNA of another organism is also known as an exogenous DNA. Genetically engineered organisms are used to study the expression of a particular gene, investigate cellular processes, study the development of a certain disease, or select traits that might be beneficial to humans. In order to do that, we have to use DNA tools. Genetic engineering can be used to increase or decrease the expression, what we see, of specific genes in selected organisms. That organism's genome is the total DNA in the nucleus of each and every cell. DNA DNA tools can be used to manipulate DNA and to isolate the genes we're looking for from the rest of the genome. One of those tools is restriction enzymes. These are proteins that recognize and bind to specific DNA sequences and cleave the DNA within that sequence. They're used as a defense mechanism by bacteria against viruses. Scientists use restriction enzymes as powerful tools for isolating specific genes or regions of the genome. Bacteria have small loops of DNA called plasmids. In genetic engineering, plasmids can be cut open with restriction enzymes, and DNA from other organisms can be inserted. Restriction enzymes recognize specific nucleotide sequences at which they make cuts in the DNA molecule. They cut in such a way as to leave jagged ends with unpaired bases. These are called sticky ends because they will hydrogen bond to complementary nucleotides. A section of foreign DNA, with the appropriate bases on its own sticky ends, can bind to the plasmid, and DNA ligase helps join the ends. The result is recombinant DNA. And to be able to see that in real time, here's a better video of that. A common technique in genetic engineering is to insert a new gene into a loop of bacterial DNA called a plasmid. The molecular tool used to cut DNA is a restriction enzyme such as ECOR1. The enzyme has a precise shape that allows it to run along the groove of the double helix, scanning in the case of ECOR1 for the base letter sequence GAATTC. The enzyme that when I was a young kid, I was really interested in genetics. Well, I didn't really understand genetics. I kind of thought that when two organisms had a baby, the baby was just this blend of the two. Yeah, that's a misconception. But I really saw genetics in action with my guppies. Guppies are very easy freshwater fish to keep in an aquarium. But they have two things that I think are especially cool. They have live birth, which means there are no eggs like many other fish. And second, they have a lot of babies. They also eat their babies, but I don't think that's especially cool. So as you can see, that is not part of my cool fact list. Anyway, when my surviving baby guppies grew up, they would have all kinds of cool traits. These traits were carried by their DNA, their genetic material, which is found in their body cells. But sometimes I would forget which mother was the mother of the baby guppy, because there were several mother fish in the tank and I wanted to keep track of inheritance in my guppy notebook. So what would have been very cool to have at that time? Some biotechnology. Biotechnology is the merge of biology and tech, and it's constantly changing. It includes topics such as PCR, cloning, and genetic engineering. It's also an awesome field. We're gonna talk about one of the biotechnologies that could have, well, potentially, helped me determine the genetic relationships of my guppies. If, you know, as a young kid, I had access to it. Although it's becoming way more common in classrooms now. And that biotechnology is gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis can be used to separate molecules based on how big they are, their size. And it's especially useful with DNA. Let's look at DNA real quick. So here is a guppy cell. Here's the nucleus in the guppy cell. Here's the DNA in the nucleus of the guppy cell. And if you were to zoom into the DNA, here is a nucleotide, which is a building block of DNA. See those phosphates in the nucleotides? They're a bit negative. Well, they contribute a negative charge anyway to the DNA. 
So, as you can see, an electric current is used to separate DNA fragments according to the size of those fragments. And when an electric current is applied, just like most people, we tend to move towards the positive people or things in our life. The smaller fragments move farther and faster than the larger ones. That's something important to note. You might want to highlight that. The unique pattern created based on the size of the DNA fragment can be compared to known DNA fragments for identification. Now, DNA fragments from different sources can be combined together to make a completely new DNA molecule. The newly generated DNA molecule with DNA from different sources is what we call recombinant DNA. There are many different types of restriction enzymes, and we encourage you to learn about how they cut DNA and how it differs with different types of restriction enzymes. This video doesn't go into the different ways that restriction enzymes cut DNA. So if I had baby guppy DNA, and adult mother guppy DNA, and I want to compare them, then I would want to use the same types of restriction enzymes in both DNA. So this is an illustration that can also be found in your book as well as online that shows what recombinant DNA technology looks like. This DNA is placed into bacterial cells for study via a carrier. Common carriers can be viruses and plasmids. Small circular, circular double-stranded DNA molecules like this one that can occur naturally in bacteria and yeast. DNA ligase, a cellular repair enzyme that you saw earlier stitching the two pieces, the sticky ends together, attaches the recombinant DNA to the plasmid. Now, gene cloning. To make a large quantity of recombinant plasmid DNA, bacterial cells are mixed with recombinant plasma DNA. Some of the bacterial cells take up the recombinant plasmid DNA through a process called transformation. Bacteria that take up the plasmid make copies of the recombinant DNA during cell replication, and then large numbers of identical bacteria containing recombinant DNA can be produced through this process called cloning. <laughs> Her name is Dolly, seven months old. She may not be the monster imagined in a science fiction fantasy, yet the cuddly Finn Dorset lamb may represent a major landmark in the history of genetic engineering. On an ordinary farm in Scotland, scientists say a clone was created from a single cell taken from the udder of a sheep. The embryo was then implanted in a surrogate, making an exact genetic copy of its so-called mother. Scientists hail it as a triumph for research in aging, medicine, and genetics. Once the sequence of DNA fragment is known, a technique called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, can be used to make millions of copies on a specific region of a DNA fragment. PCR can copy or amplify a single DNA molecule numerous times for use in analysis. There's also an acronym that says CRISPR, and I'm gonna show it to you here in a minute. Your book doesn't talk about it, and frankly, it's brand new technology. And even though you have brand new books, that's how new the technology is. It didn't make it into the book. We'll talk about that more in class. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, three billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy, but recently a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. 
When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise. For example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. So one of the words you probably just heard in the videos was transgenic organism, and that means an organism with genes from other organisms. So transgenic animals, plants, and bacteria are used for research, medicine, and agriculture. Scientists produce most transgenic animals in laboratories for biological research so that we can study diseases, improve food supply, improve human health, and be potential sources of organs for transplant. Frequently genetically engineered for resistance against insects or viral pests for transgenic plants. Other plants are designed to reduce allergic reactions in humans, contain increased vitamin and mineral content so you can consume less and get more nourishment, resist extreme weather, and produce vaccines as well as biodegradable plastics. In transgenic bacteria, they produce insulin and growth hormones, slow the formation of ice on crops, clean up oil spills, and decompose garbage. GMOs are one of the most controversial areas of science. From anti-aging therapy in mice, animals carrying human cells, breeding the healthiest livestock, and building organs outside the body, genetic engineers are constantly searching for answers to many social challenges. From global issues to medicine, these guys put everything to the test. One of the biggest goals of genetic modification is to reduce world hunger by producing more food. These featherless chickens have been genetically engineered to keep them cool. Since I am a geneticist, I was looking for a genetic solution. That means instead of cooling the environment of, the, of chickens with feathers, is helping them feel cool by just removing the feathers. Without feathers and scales on their feet, these birds can grow comfortably in hot countries like Nigeria and Indonesia. The hope is that once successfully bred, the healthy commercial-sized birds will help feed underdeveloped countries.